worth anything. It's only made of rags. It helps keep out the wind. My babies will get sick. I'm sorry, Miss Moody. It's the law. Oh, and the stove wood? You know, Mrs. Moody, I'm sorry your husband died and left you with all these youngsters. But I got my rights. You can't pay, so all these things are mine now. Besides, uh, what I'm doing is uh, really an act of charity. Yes, it is. You see, uh, without uh, food, furniture, money, or even uh, firewood, uh, you're going to have to get help. Now, you could go on for a while without any help, but uh, sooner or later you've got to get help. Choice. What will you do with these children? You'll have to give these children to relatives? Have somebody else take them in? Mrs. Moody, you can't raise this but brood yourself. The sooner you realize that, the better. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I'm doing you a favor. Uh, you will uh, grateful to me one of these days. don't have a choice. I never thought I'd hear my brother say something like that. But it's impossible. No. I won't break up my family. We'll manage. I'll find work. That's nonsense. We can take a couple no, in and... No, I mean it. We're going to stay together. The older ones will take care of the babies. We'll get along. Mm. Dwight, do you need any help? No, I'm all packed. Well, maybe you don't have to leave today. Maybe it'll rain. Oh, I'm sorry, son. But when your brother ran away, I guess I just get jittery about my other children leaving home. Don't worry about me, Mother. Well, be sure and write. And remember to go to church. And remember everything you've learned. And don't... Mother, this will be a short letter, as I'm busy most of the time. I've taken work at Uncle Shoe Store and am learning to sell. You'll be glad to know that I go to church and Sunday school every Sabbath. And Mother, ain't no need for you to worry about me here in the big city. It's true, Boston's kind of worldly, but there's churches too. I've been attending a Sunday school near work. My teacher, Mr. Kimball, takes a keen interest in all us boys, but he sure is kind of shy and tongue-tied. If they fit a little tight, you can take them right to the cobbler right over there, and he'll uh, fit them right to you. All right. Yes, sir. Uh... How are you, Dwight? Please, Mr. Kimball, call me D.L. I always thought Dwight sounded a bit uppity. I was thinking this morning I should come and talk to you about Christ, about your soul. Well, on the way down here, I mean, this is business hours. Perhaps I'm embarrassing you on the job. No, wait, it's all right. Well... You know the Lord loves you, and he wants you to love him. You know the Gospels. You know that Jesus Christ died for you, 
And he wants you to give your life to him and to live for him. ticket for five dollars on the immigrant train to Chicago. Uncle Samuel objected to my going, but I had to come. Chicago's a very lively city, and to my liking. Why, I've heard of folks coming here poor and now rich. I aim to get rich too. I set myself a goal and pray every night that God will help me to, to earn a fortune. I aim to get $100,000 as my fortune. I already put my savings into some land and sold it at a profit. I'm also in some other deals and, and making money. I'm going to send you some and hope it will help. Chicago has a reputation for wildness, and there is something going on all the time. Oh, but uh, don't fret, Mother, because I still enjoy my religion and church going. Why, well, I'm even going to ask to teach my own Sunday school class. No, I'm sorry, Moody. We already have too many teachers. If you want to teach Sunday school, you'll just have to go somewhere else. Or find your own pupils. into his Sunday school work as he does selling shoes. Everybody sit down. I'm your teacher, D.L. Moody. All right, all right, settle down, quiet. I'm D.L. Moody, your new teacher, and I want to tell you about Zacchaeus. Dear's mother, I expect you'd like to hear some of the news from Chicago. It don't seem like I've been here seven years already, but it's so. I've been traveling across the Midwest helping start Sunday schools. I believe it's God's work. Today, I'm going to go to a lot of wealthy merchants and ask for their help. All my love, D.L. John Farwell. Ah. It's good to see you. <laughs> Be seated. Uh, Good to see you. Have you been sitting here thinking up schemes to beat your competition? I'm glad, Moody. Only Marshall Field is my competition. I'd hate to think what my business life would be like if you were still in business. Oh, I guess I'd give you a run for the money, all right. <laughs> Moody, I still don't understand. Why did you leave business? Oh, I didn't leave it. God just called me to a different work. But you were on your way to make a fortune. 
Why, just last year you made $5,000. You were on your way to realize your goal of $100,000, and you left it all. Why? Oh, I fought it tooth and nail. But I got a call, just like Matthew, to, to leave, to give up business and go after Christ. <laughs> it were a terrible struggle, but... But when I give up, God begun to bless. Well, from $5,000 a year ago to, uh, what have you earned this year? Oh, uh, a hundred, uh, hundred and fifty dollars. John, I'm after getting rich in eternity, not time. Well, uh, Moody, I guess if you can give up everything for God, well, I suppose I can give up a little too. Isn't it about time that your Sunday school has a building of its own? Well, I was saying that to Marshall Field just this morning. He believes in the work too, John. Uh, he'd give me a check for 2000 Well, then I guess this check for $3,000 will help? Why, I should say so. It's uh, almost as much as uh, Cyrus McCormick gave me for the work. Oh? Okay, Moody. Is anybody given $5,000 for your building fund? Uh, not yet. Of course, I got a couple of more calls to make. But I'm certain no one would give me 10000 <laughs> That's interesting because the very first figure that came into my mind was $10,000. But I've been trying to talk it down. God put it in your head. He knows what you can give. Woody, just a minute. When are you going to settle down and get married? I am. Um, yes, sir. Uh, John, there's this young woman at church, Emma, and she and me kind of been seeing each other regular, kind of serious. But I'm afraid to ask her to marry me because, well, I mean, what kind of life would it be for a woman to, to be married to an itinerant Sunday school worker with no real income? D.L., I think you ought to ask her that question. See what she thinks. you left business. Do you regret it? Do you? Not for a minute. We've done all right. God's been good to us. Besides, if you'd stayed in business and made a fortune, things wouldn't be any different. You'd have given it all away to the Lord's work. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. But I can't help but feel that God wants something more for me somehow. More? Well, maybe preaching. I'm a good organizer, a mover, a fundraiser, but I got this fire to tell folks about Christ. I know. Seems every cobbler and carriage driver we see gets a personal sermon from D.L. Moody. <laughs> you know, D.L., did you ever think that you could reach hundreds, maybe even thousands, if you preach to large audiences? Oh, but, but I got no formal training. Oh, nonsense. You studied more than most seminary graduates. Why don't you talk to John Farwell about it? 
Emma's right. You've got a gift. You ought to use it. I don't know. It's just different talking to people one on one. Well, that's what I mean. You've got a gift of communicating with people. I've heard you speak to crowds and leave the impression that you're only talking to the individual. Come here. Look down there. You could work night and day trying to talk to people one at a time. DL, use your personal approach. If you want to win more people, you got to win the crowds. If you can get a crowd, you'll convince more people into the kingdom. You know, the worst enemy a man has is his self. His pride and self-confidence gets in his way. It ruins him. It gets in his way of trusting the savior. Now, you might wash a pump, but that don't make the water pure. <laughs> yeah, has to get your heart right with God. Now, some folks come to me and ask me about rules for their own conduct. They say, is it all right to go to the theater? Or, is it all right, I'd like to know, to smoke and drink moderately? <laughs> well, I can't carry your consciences, but I have one rule. And that is, I give Christ the benefit of the doubt. It's better to be too strict than too liberal. The eyes of the world are on you. I can imagine Christ coming to that feller who put his crown of thorns on his head, saying, I forgive you. And if you'll ask my forgiveness, I'll give you a crown without no thorns. So come now while I'm speaking. Make a full, complete, and unconditional surrender to God. And say, here I am, Lord. Take me and use me and give me the privilege of being a co-worker with thee. And there will be a fire kindled here that will burn into eternity. This hour, this minute, make up your minds that from this time's forth, you're going to be on the Lord's side. But what are you doing differently? Nothing. It's just that now I got the power. Power? I don't understand. Well, two ladies I know come up to me one day and says, Mr. Moody, we're praying for you. Praying for me, I says. Why don't you pray for the people? And they says, because you need the power of the Holy Spirit. I says, me? I need the power. They said they was praying that I would be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, that got me a thinking. And the more I thought about it, the thirstier I become to receive this power. I was praying, crying all the time, that God would fill me with his spirit. And? It happened one day in New York. Oh, what a day. I can't describe it. Seldom even mention it. It seems an experience too holy to even name. I can only say that God filled me with his Holy Spirit, revealed it to me in such a way that I had to ask him to stay his hand. Then, when I went to preaching again, my sermons wasn't any different, but more people was converted. It was unbelievable. There were 5,000 in Pittsburgh, 8,000 in Philadelphia. Hundreds come into the inquiry room to pray. And from what I hear, you're getting invitations to speak all over the country. People want to hear D.L. Well, it hasn't gone to your head, I hope. Oh, okay. Um, and John, uh, me and Emma have been praying that God would send me my own song leader and singer. I've been to more religious meetings lately that are sadder than a funeral. The 
people's faces is like icicles. When a church grows cold, they hire a choir, stick them up in the loft, and has them do all the singing. I want the people to sing. Why, music's as important as the preaching. You should be able to warm them up and get them to sing. Me? Sing? <laughs> Why, my singing sounds like a piano dropped down the stairway. <laughs> you pray with us, John, that God will send me a singer. <laughs> D.L. Moody. Yes, I know. I want to thank you for saving this service. Your music blessed me. Well, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Your singing woke them people up to hear the message God had for them. Thanks again. Don't take much to put a church crowd to sleep. Some people say an awful lot before they get their prayers out. Most prayers would be better if they was cut on both ends and set fire in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> You're Sankey, ain't you? Yes, sir. Mm. Where are you from? Uh, Pennsylvania. Newcastle, Pennsylvania. You married? Yes. I have two children. What's your business? I'm in government service. Revenue. Oh. Tax collector, huh? Well, you have to give that up. I uh, beg pardon? I said you'll have to give your position up. Why? To come to Chicago to help me with the work. <laughs> You're serious? You really want me to come to Chicago? You must come. I've been praying for you for eight years. Now that God led me to you, I ain't letting you go. But, but I have a responsible position. Oh, I, I, I know. There's a hundred excuses, but, but they don't hold water. But, but it's impossible. Will you pray about it? Yes, I suppose so. That's fair enough. I'll pray about it, too. <laughs> come to hear Moody preach. And some of you come to hear my new song leader, Ira Sankey. So come on, let's hear Sankey sing the gospel. Oh, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now. Sleep? Hours ago. Shouldn't you be coming to bed? Oh. Em. Oh. oh. You're a treasure. You do know I love you, don't you? I do. But I never tire of hearing you say it. Em. I'm in a dither. Does God want me to be a social organizer or an evangelist? Well, seems to me there's no confusion. You've been doing both for as long as I've known you. Yeah. But when I try to do more than one thing at a time, I make it half a job. Half a job by Moody. It's better than a whole job by someone else. <laughs> What am I good at, Em? Seriously. Well, what do you think God's calling you to do? As an organizer, you've launched the Sunday School Movement, started a Bible Society, got the YMCA work going, built Farwell Hall, and the Illinois Street Mission. 
Maybe God wants me to do that. Or maybe he wants me to be an evangelist. You're very good at that, too. <laughs> you can thank Harry Morehouse for that. You remember that little Englishman that stirred things up down at the Illinois Street Tabernacle? I remember he stirred you up. Hmm. Before Morehouse came, Moody used to preach on the wrath of God, that God hates the sinners. Then along comes that little baby-faced Englishman, and do you know that he had spent some time in jail before he was converted? Preached a whole week on the love of God. Said that God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. Why, it'd give me a whole new perspective. M. as an evangelist, I'd have to travel a lot. Maybe more than I do now. Well, M. what's it to be? Organizer or evangelist? Well, perhaps you don't have to decide just now. You could stay in Chicago and do your other work and then preach to hundreds, even thousands, every week. It would be practically the same as being an evangelist, but you could stay here, not have to leave Farwell Hall and those beautiful new facilities. Now, many of you have been coming here these past five weeks to these meetings. And for the last four Sunday nights, you've heard me talk about Jesus and what you can do to be saved. What then shall I do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? I want you to take that question home with you this week and turn it over in your minds. And next Sunday, I want you to come back here to Farwell Hall and tell me what you're going to do with him. Now, I want my new singer, Ira Sankey, to come up. It's a bad fire. The wind is taking it clear across the city. Chicago, it's on fire. <laughs> save much. No one did. But we're still alive. And the children are safe. 
It looks... It looks like them four horse fellers from Revelation has rid through here. So much is gone. The YMCA burnt down. The Illinois Street Mission, gone. Farwell Hall, our home. There ain't nothing left in all of Chicago. Then I wonder. What's to hold you back from becoming an evangelist? What? You asked me whether you should be an organizer or an evangelist. Everything you organize by way of buildings, churches, halls you raised money for, they're all gone. So are the people. It were a mistake. I, I should have never given them time to decide. Some of them people didn't have a week. We really don't know what'll happen tomorrow, do we? I should have given them people a chance to decide right then and there. Him. I will become an evangelist. And as I stand here before the Lord, I promise never to let an audience go out again without giving them a chance to trust Christ. to London for rest and study, to study these English Christians and see what kind of creatures they be. <laughs> of course, I suppose you've come here today to study me. <laughs> now, pardon while I draw on my imagination. Blind bottomies had just come back from a sea in Jesus. And he met up with this little feller, Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus says, how is it you can see? And Bartimaeus says, Jesus done it. Jesus of Nazareth. He had mercy upon me. Well, now, you can imagine that Zacchaeus wanted to meet up with Jesus, but being a short little man, he had to climb up in a tree to get a look. And when Jesus comes passing by, he says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down here. Now Zacchaeus must have thought, how do you know my name? Who told him? But Jesus noted, And sinner, Christ knows all about you. You can't hide from him. He knows where you are and all about you. You know, Sankey, I have to tell you, I've never approached any meetings with as much apprehension. Imagine, Moody, addressing Cambridge University students and faculty. How's my hat? I'm nervous. Don't be nervous. You'll be fine. I overheard one of those professors this morning. He said Moody's grammar is atrocious. There's no other person can say the word Jerusalem in just two syllables. That's supposed to make me feel better? There's more. He said Moody can't read Greek or Hebrew and even has trouble with the English Bible. Ah. Listen. Just listen. He also said that no one can get the public to see a point of scripture more capably than you. And then he said, D.L. Moody is the greatest communicator I've ever heard. They love you, D.L. People flock to hear. 
and then the Holy Spirit begins to work with them. Why, even that student fringe is coming around. You don't need to be nervous, D.L., not at all. D.L., it's Ira. She was Emmer with the porter and the steamer truck. When I left you in the inquiry room, I thought you'd be a while. Dio, the paper said we sang and preached over five million people. That's so. Mm -hmm. Good way to end our British campaign. You, uh, happy about going back to America? Yep. It's been two years since I left Chicago. I've uh, been back to Northfield. I think our families are happy about going back to America, too. Tell you something, Sankey. I came to England two years ago to rest and study. Well, I'm gonna get that rest, even if I have to go back to Northfield to do it. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. There's my brother Samuel. Sam! Samuel! D.L., welcome home. I'll meet you back at the house. Your brother's a good man. But even a lot of good men won't get to heaven. Em, why is it that I can preach to millions, but when I come back home, it's like coming back to the ashes of Chicago. You mean because Samuel's never trusted Christ? And my mother, too. She's been a pious Puritan all her life, but she ain't never been born again. It's strange, Em. I can preach in England and all across the country to numbers I can't even count. But it don't mean a thing. Of course it does. Why, hundreds of thousands of souls will be in heaven because you obeyed God. I don't know, Em. It seems ineffective. Some decisions don't last. But most do. But where's the value? If a man can go across the ocean and preach while his own mother and brother is measuring the days till they die and go to hell. Jesus. The decision is yours to make. Your wife can't make it for you. 
Your best friend can make it for you. No man on earth can make it for you. This is my hometown. And I know many of you are here. But I want to give you the same invitation that I gave them in London. If any of you want to claim Jesus Christ as the Son of God and your Savior, stand up so we can pray for you. Come on, stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Come on, stand up for Christ. I stand up for... Constantly surprises me. I know. I've been thinking about that and a lot of other things since I got back from overseas. Mostly, I've been thinking about what Butcher Varley said to me. Who? Butcher? Oh, that English evangelist. Uh, one day says to me, Moody, the world has yet to see what God can do uh, with and for and through a man who is uh, fully, fully consecrated to him. Interesting. After that, I, I seen them words everywhere, on the ceiling, the walls, the floors, as if they was posted there. The world has yet to see what God can do with and for and through a man who is fully, fully consecrated to him. A man. Just a man. He didn't say he had to be educated or, or brilliant. Just a man. He didn't say he had to be wiser than anybody else or know everything or, or wait to be rich. Just a man. Him. Emma, I could be that man. By the Holy Spirit in me, I will be that man. It's good to see you again, D.L. It's been a long time. We've got a lot of catching up to do. Oh, it's good to be back. Really? I thought you'd lost interest in Chicago. I guess you could say we've become sort of religious tramps. <laughs> no city can claim us. Well, tell me about your last trip to the British Isles. Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, um, remember I told you about the Cambridge Seven? Uh, those university students that gave up everything to serve Christ as missionaries? Africa, India, China. Well, one day Emmer suggested that we have an American missionary conference. So uh, I invited him over here to speak at uh, our colleges and universities. And? Oh, it was amazing, John. Why, we recruited student volunteers from everywhere. If we get enough volunteers, well, we can evangelize the whole world by the end of the century. <clears throat> well, what is it, George? There's a woman here, sir, to see Mr. Moody. Mr. I, uh, I, uh, ask her to meet me here. Uh, yes. Send her in, George. But who is she, D.L.? Oh, uh, name's Miss Emma Dreyer. Oh, <laughs> Miss Dreyer. Mr. Moody. Good to see you. Pleased to meet you. Please be seated, Miss Dreyer. Thank you. Uh... I'm sorry if I'm intruding. Oh, on the contrary, it's God's timing. Pardon? Uh, Miss Dreyer has been pestering, uh, prevailing upon me to start a Bible Institute. But uh, 
I'll let her do the speaking for herself. Thank you, Mr. Moody. It is true that I... I, I have been persistent. I about... told her I didn't think so. I didn't want to compete with the seminaries in the East. But she's persistent. Miss Dreyer, maybe the time's right for it now. I said, maybe it's God's time for it now. We've been recruiting hundreds of student missionary volunteers, young men, women too. Now, where are they going to get their training? Certainly not those dry as dust seminaries in the East. Of course. A place to learn Bible? We need a school to train and educate evangelists, teachers, missionaries. Yes, sir. Well, what do you say, Miss Dreyer? Shall we start a Bible Institute? I'll, um, I'll write you from Ohio and Illinois. The children love to get your letters, too. Mm. Especially Will. I'll write them. Dear Father, by the time you get my letter, I will have completed my first year at Yale. University life has been a challenge. The studies are more demanding than the Mont Hermon classes. I've been wrestling with a great many new thoughts and ideas. I think most of my ideas I caught from you, Father. But now, away from home and free to think my own thoughts, I've come up with some conclusions which you may find strange for me, even offensive. You see, Father, I've decided that your way of faith, your religion, is not for me. I trust you'll understand. I want to live my own life free of religion. Lovingly, your son, Will. So, uh, Emmer said I should come see you before we went back to America. I never thought about slowing down. Should I? Well, frankly, yes. Your heart isn't all it should be. How often do you preach? Oh, maybe three, four times a day. Five or six on a Sunday. How many days a week? Six, except for last winter, then it was seven. Mr. Moody? You're a fool. You're killing yourself. Well, <clears throat> to tell you the truth, I, uh, I was thinking about slowing down when we got back to America. I'm uh, supposed to plan and uh, carry out a campaign in connection with the Chicago World's Fair. Be day and night for almost a year. Tell them to get someone else. I mean it. Your heart will not stop. I'm glad I came with. The British Isles are fascinating. Mother tells me you uh, might not come back to Chicago for the World's Fair. I've been uh, thinking about it. I was uh, drafting a letter to the campaign committee this morning down in my cabin, but it uh, made me kind of seasick. <laughs> oh? i uh, been thinking of maybe giving up all my campaign work. Really? I'm resigned to the fact that I'll never evangelize the whole world, so maybe I ought to stop now. Maybe. Ah, come quick. How about that? The ship is sinking. What happened? They finally got the panic a little bit under control. I seen one man try to jump overboard. Well, the captain told me that the main propeller shaft is busted. That the engine rooms in the lower decks is taken on water. The 
Cubs can't keep up fast enough. We're, we're in grave danger here. Yeah. We, we, we've got to pray. I guess your prayers didn't take, Pa. It was strange, Will. It was the most unusual experience. It was... It was as if God said to me, Woody, you want to quit, hey? Take it easy, hey? Go slow, hey? Well, Woody, I'm going to call you to me right now, because you're of no use to me. If you don't keep on preaching, if you don't keep on serving me, well, I... You've got a right to let up, Pa. I can't imagine anyone ever coming close to all that you've done. You've got a right to let up. Retire. That's the point, son. The Lord knows that, that preaching is my lifeblood. I can't stop. I'm going to my cabin to pray. Will, if the Lord spares me, spares us, I'm going to vow here and now to give him all I have. If it's a year, five years, seven years, I'm going to give him all I got. Good news. We've sighted a freighter. They must have seen our distress. Will they help? The captain says that we'll use a tow rope. With their help, we'll make it back to Liverpool. Ah, oh, thank God. Thank God. <laughs> God's will be done. Northfield to heaven. I'm ready. Uh, Pa? You're ready, but, uh... What is it, son? Pa, you remember that letter I wrote you when I was at Yale? Oh. The one about religion. The one where you said my religion wasn't yours. Well, Pa, I've decided to follow Christ, too. Will you pray with me like you used to? <gasps> My son, my son. <laughs> Be surprised. Pa knew. He told me when we were on the spree, but he believed God wanted him to go on, whether it was one year, five, or seven. And at least he was able to come home for the Come on. Let's go back to the house. Someday you'll read in the newspapers that Moody is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the spirit in 1855. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the spirit shall live forever. Forever.